Modern ether anesthesia illustrates the striking advances of a century of medicine. The modern rebreathing apparatus and the skill of the anesthetists shown here are in arresting contrast to the apparatus and method of administration used at this same hospital in 1846 in the first public demonstration of surgical anesthesia. The studied speed and efficiency of the whole surgical team is in marked contrast to the crude haste required before the advent of anesthesia. When even doctors considered operative surgery an inferior part of their profession and the surgeon as an armed savage. Modern surgery truly dates from the day when the surgeon was assured that his patient felt no pain and was in a state of complete relaxation. Today, the surgeon can rely on an ether of standard stability and potency, which, with its quality protected by the most rigid tests, is one of the purest products in present-day Materia Medica. The difference between it and the ether of 1846, with all its variability in strength and its impurities, is as pronounced as is the difference between the modern rebreathing apparatus and Morton's crude sponge in a glass globe. This transformation has been wrought through the skilled application of the science of distillation by the manufacturing chemists, who gradually took over the production of anesthetic ether from the pioneer experimentalists and apothecaries. The origin of the art of distillation lies in antiquity. For Aristotle mentions that pure water may be obtained from seawater by evaporation and subsequent condensation. And Pliny described the distillation of mercury from cinnabar. Let us for a few moments examine into the development of this ancient art. In 1553, Porter wrote of it, now I am come to the arts and I shall begin from distillation, an invention of later times, a wonderful thing to be praised beyond the power of man. The early alchemists used distillation apparatus such as this to separate essential oils, such as oil of rosemary and juniper, or to separate alcohol from wine. A still similar to this was probably used by the German physician Valerius Cordus who first produced ether from alcohol and sulfuric acid. This ether was listed in the pharmacopoeias of about 1560 as oleum vitrioli dulce verum. In the succeeding centuries, ether became known as sulfuric ether because of the erroneous idea that it contained sulfur. This was disproved by Valentin Rose the Younger in 1800. And in 1860, Williamson, a pupil of Liebig, made clear the reaction that produced ether. He regarded alcohol and ether analogous to and built up on the type of water, as his definition and formulae show. While the purification of ether, even in Morton's time, was fairly well understood by research chemists, in all probability, the ether used by Morton and others for anesthetic purposes was made by the primitive method of the United States Pharmacopeia of 1840. Following these directions, the apothecary of the day poured into a tubulated retort a certain amount of alcohol and added, in small portions, a similar weight of strong sulfuric acid. This was boiled and the vapor condensed in a cool receiver. More alcohol was added during the course of the distillation. The resulting distillate contained, along with the ether, both alcohol and water, and some acid, together with incidental impurities. By treating with caustic potash and redistilling, the acid and some of the alcohol were removed. Ether prepared by such a method would vary from batch to batch according to the skill and care exercised by the individual pharmacist preparing it. And while accurate data are lacking, it is safe to assume that ether made by this method might often have an ether content as low as 65% to 70%, the balance consisting of alcohol and water. Until the early 1850s, ether was produced by such open fire intermittent distillation methods. In 1856, 
an important contribution was published by Edward R. Squibb, then assistant director of the United States Naval Laboratory, who developed a method of making ether using steam-heated lead coils. The next several decades were marked by significant changes in both manufacturing methods and the strength and quality of the product, so that by 1890, the pharmacopoeia required that ether for anesthesia have a composition of 96% ether, the remaining 4% being alcohol and a little water. The importance of maintaining the proper amount of alcohol can be demonstrated by this experiment. The ether mask used in the administration of anesthetic ether by the drop method is dyed black for contrast. In the absence of the proper amount of alcohol, ether under certain atmospheric conditions will produce this frosting action over the mask by the condensation of moisture from the air. In a very short time, all passage through the mask would be effectively blocked by the heavy frost. Alcohol acts as a defroster and is a desirable component of ether. Ether manufacture must therefore be so controlled as to maintain the proportions of ether and alcohol which long experience has shown to provide the best and safest ether for anesthesia. While such high test ether could have been prepared by laboratory methods, even in Morton's day, its large scale production became practical only through development of the fractionating column. This glass model consists of a series of perforated plates holding a shallow layer of condensed liquid continuously running down from the condenser on top, while the vapors from the still below bubble upward and are thoroughly washed. The effect is to boil out the more volatile component, in this case the ether, and to carry downwards the less volatile, that is the alcohol, into the still, thus affecting the desired separation. The manufacturing chemists soon recognized that 96% ether easily obtained with well-designed, large-scale fractionating columns on the principle of the glass model, contained the incidental impurities of Morton's ether, chiefly acetaldehyde, which clings to ether with great tenacity. Presumably, recognizing the difficulty of removing this impurity, the United States Pharmacopeia test, even as late as 1910, tolerated a content of about five one-hundredths of a percent of aldehyde. Aldehyde is colorless, but let us demonstrate this concentration by the addition of the same percentage of a dye solution. By improved manufacturing processes and the adoption of a different and more sensitive test, this aldehyde impurity has now been limited to the extraordinarily small figure of five ten thousandths of a percent. Here is this smaller percent of the dye solution added to the same volume. All of the well-known brands of anesthetic ether now comply with the requirements of the recent editions of the United States Pharmacopeia and approximate this degree of purity. Here you see a simplified small-scale model of a modern ether system capable of removing aldehyde. Acid resulting from the reaction between alcohol and sulfuric acid in the still, is removed from the impure ether vapor by washing with an alkali solution in a packed tower. The ether vapor, still containing much alcohol and small amounts of aldehyde, then passes into a tall fractionating column. The column is of the bubble cap type instead of the perforated plate type explained earlier, but the principle of operation is similar. Waste ether containing the aldehyde is drawn off in this small bottle on the left. Alcohol condensing lower in the column flows back into the still for another treatment with sulfuric acid. In actual practice, the apparatus is much more complex, representing years of study and experimentation with various arrangements of large-scale fractionating columns. The process is continuous requiring night and day operation to maintain its delicately balanced 
uniform flow, and represents so near an approximation to perfection in the distiller's art that modern anesthetic ether may be regarded as one of the purest of chemical substances today. But the careful preparation of ether is not the sole guarantee that it will meet the standards of purity required for anesthesia. The property of ether to change during storage was observed as early as 1811 by Planche, who recommended that to prevent such deterioration, ether should be kept in cellars in filled bottles. In 1816, Gay-Lussac discovered the presence of other impurities in ether kept for long periods in bottles, opened from time to time, and noted that when intentionally concentrated, as shown here, these, which we now know to be ether peroxides, had explosive properties. Bertolo, in 1899, proved that no such impurities formed if ether were sealed in glass tubes with all air removed. After confirming this result, an experimental apparatus was designed to produce and package ether without contact with air. Air-free ether was produced in a distillation column of special design. Air is removed by a vacuum pump from the ether cans contained in a tube locked off by suitable valves. Air-free gas then fills this tube, and the cans drop into a box filled with this same inert gas. Here, the operator, inserting his hand in a rubber sleeve attached to the air-free box, fills the cans with ether, then caps and seals them. This was followed by a design in which mechanical equipment took care of exhausting the air, filling, capping, and sealing. The entire apparatus was enclosed in an atmosphere of nitrogen. Shortly after this, a continuous process machine was devised. Air is first removed from the cans, which rest in cylindrical pockets of a wheel. This wheel passes under airtight shoes, first to the vacuum pump, later to the filler, and finally to the capping machine. This series of automatic machines constituted the first successful technique for preventing the formation of ether peroxides in packaged ether. Paralleling these mechanical developments, continued research revealed that the tin on the inner surface of the can acted as a catalyst, causing the oxygen of the air in the sealed can to combine with ether to form small amounts of ether peroxides. A simple process of oxidizing the inner can surface was then developed, and this made it unnecessary to utilize the patented mechanical air-free packaging machines, although they probably provided the most rigorous solution of the problem. The cans are oxidized by being exposed to controlled heat treatment in air for a time interval in excess of that required for a complete coating of the inside surfaces with a film of oxide. They are then ready for filling. Another manufacturer has introduced an antioxidant by copper plating the inside surfaces, thus accomplishing a similar result. The cans are now fed into the specially developed automatic filling machine. The machine raises each can so that a filling nozzle enters the neck and a properly adjusted charge of ether flows in. Here is the machine in operation. The cans move steadily into position under the nozzles and are held there until filled. Inside the filling chamber is an ingenious arrangement of measuring cups. The whole device is held at a fixed angle so that the rotating cups are above the surface of the ether on one side and below it on the opposite side. The cups are thus filled to the edge and are emptied into the cans below by valves which open at the proper time. The filled cans then move to a conveyor which carries them to the sealing machine. The capping and sealing of ether cans has also undergone a progressive series of changes. Even up to 1922, ether cans had always been hermetically sealed by applying a lead cap and soldering it to the can nozzle painstakingly by hand. A special solder was used 
with a melting point so low that it would not cause the ether to take fire. No matter how carefully this was done, traces of soldering flux introduced an undesirable contamination into the contents of the can. For many years, research was directed toward a more efficient closure. Various experimental types of screw caps were effective, as evidenced by these cans, which are still full of ether, although they were closed 30 years ago. But such types proved undesirably expensive. The first practical mechanical sealer for ether can nozzles was invented by Mr. Fred Westerbeck of the Columbia Can Company in collaboration with this company. In this closure, a disc of soft metal is placed on and overhanging the nozzle of the ether can. A ring is then slipped over the soft metal cap and a capping machine crimps the ring around the soft metal under such pressure that the soft metal flows to form an hermetically tight seal around the nozzle. Subsequent improvements have joined the two cap elements so that they are placed on the cans in a single operation. The machine closes this seal under heavy pressure. Comparison of this modern seal with the old soldering method on the left provides visual evidence of how the modern closure is effective and at the same time avoids the contamination incident to the soldering process. This efficient device then sends the cans into a leak testing machine. The seal cans are immersed in hot water. Here, a trained observer easily spots any cans whose bubbles are effective evidence of leaks. Such cans are removed, and the rest pass on to the automatic labeling machines. Packing is not quite the final step in this manufacturing chemist's preparation of ether for anesthesia. At this point, samples are tested to make certain that the product meets all of the company's specifications. For ether, for anesthesia, must travel to the far corners of the earth. Unquestionably, it carries the major anesthesia burden of the world. Purchases by the armed services from all manufacturers during the war amounted to over 12,700,000 quarter pound cans. Since the advent of anesthesia, a century of progress in the manufacturing, chemical control, and scientific packaging of ether has kept abreast of the great strides made in surgery and the practice of anesthesia. Today, ether for anesthesia is administered with complete confidence in its effectiveness, its purity, and its safety. <laughs>